Good morning, church. Thanks for watching our live stream. If it's your first time watching us, make sure to connect with us on foothillonline.org. We're going to go into a time of worship, so open up your hearts and get ready.
listening on our website at foothillonline.org or text the number down below. We're going to get ready to get into the Word with Pastor Steve. Hey, good morning, Foothill family online. It's so good to have you with us online in this service. Just want to remind you, if you'd like to visit one of our in-person services, we have Foothill Napa Campus and the Foothill American Canyon Campus with Pastor Rick Mendez. Come see us on Sunday. We would love to see you. But we'd love for you to continue enjoying us online as well. Hey, this morning we're going to continue in our series, Just Stay Connected. Jesus basically said to his disciples, just stay connected to me. In John chapter 15, the last couple weeks, we've been looking at this metaphor that Jesus used. This viticulture metaphor, a word picture of our relationship and how important it is to stay connected to him. Jesus said to his disciples while he's sitting with them at the Last Supper, he said, listen, I want to tell you something. It's so important that you stay connected to me. And then he describes the connection with this word picture of a viticulture word picture, which is Jesus says, I am the vine and you're the branch. And if you stay connected to me, then the life flow that comes through me, through the trunk of the the tree, if you will, into the branch, will flow from me to you. He says you, you have to stay connected. If you disconnect as a branch from the vine, the life source from me, Jesus says, you won't bear any fruit. You can try to manage fruit all by yourself, but the withering process has begun once a branch is removed from the vine or the tree. So Jesus is saying how important it is for us to stay connected to him. And he said, now listen, disciples, uh, in a couple hours, I'm going to experience the cross uh, and I'm going to be taken to the cross. I'm going to die. In three days, I'm going to rise from the dead. And then I'm going to see you for a short while. For 40 days, I'm going to visit you on occasion. But then I'm going to heaven, and through all of this, it's going to get a little crazy. He goes, but I need you to remember this. And Jesus said, I need to be your primary connection, your primary connection. And you can't let any other connections come before me. Hey, as we think about that this morning, the truth is there's a war going on to gain your attention and my attention. And then to get us connected and then keep us connected, right? Can you say commercial, right? Every commercial, every marketing strategy is about getting your attention, getting you connected, and then doing everything to keep you connected. But if you're not careful and if I'm not careful, these distractions can lead us away from our primary connection, which is with Jesus. Jesus says, I have to be your number one primary connection. He says, just stay connected to me. And if you'll do that, he says, I'll produce fruit in you. You won't be able to produce it all by yourself, but through me, I can produce limbs on your life that produce amazing fruit. And so all of this is described in John chapter 15, verses 7 through 8. Now, I'm going to read this if you... If you haven't listened to the previous uh, sermons, uh, Just Stay Connected, Part 1 and Part 2, I'd encourage you to do that. But we're going to jump in at verse 7 through 8. John chapter 15, verse 7 and 8. And here's what Jesus tells his disciples. He describes what I've just talked about, staying connected. He says to remain in me or stay connected. But then in addition to that, he says something that, that seems a little crazy, right? Jesus says some things that sometimes we hear them, we read through the Bible, and we go, wow, that's, that's pretty crazy. I mean, I don't... And then we just blow through it, and if we're not careful, we just kind of think, well, oh, that's what Jesus says, and I don't really know what that means. Here's one of those statements that's pretty crazy, and if it's true, it's absolutely amazing, but I need to get my arms around it. We're going to try to get our arms around this thought. Jesus says, and whatever you wish, it will be done to you. Now listen to how crazy that thought sounds. Whatever I wish, if I pray and stay connected to you, 
then whatever it is I wish, it'll be done for me. That, that just, I mean, I hope that's true, right? But inside, you and I are going, I don't know that God's going to give me everything I wish for. And we're going to try to unpack that this morning. So, so read with me. Here's verse 7. Verse 7 says this. If you remain in me, that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. Now listen, and my word remains in you. So there's two conditions in order for us to move towards this promise where any, whatever wish I, uh, I have, it will be done for me. The only way that happens is if these two conditions are met. If you remain in me, Jesus says, and my words remain in you, then ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Listen to verse 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. So the Father bear, uh, wants to bear much fruit in our lives and it brings Him glory. Look what it goes on to say. Shown yourselves to be my disciples. So let's see if we can unpack this. What does it mean for when Jesus uses these words, abide in me or remain in me or just stay connected? Now, we've looked at that for the last couple weeks. That's condition number one. How do we stay connected to Jesus? He's the most powerful and the primary connection that you and I need to maintain. And, the, and we've asked you over the last couple weeks, is that true of you? Have you allowed life to distract you? We can allow relationships to get us distracted. Not only can they get us distracted from our family, uh, relationships, business relationships can keep us distracted from our our marriage from our kids work can get us distracted from our kids and our family and our marriage and those we love i mean there's so many distractions out there right we can get distracted by gaming we can get distracted by facebook how many likes or hits did i get we're trying to get this connection online that that we long for and if we're not careful we miss out on the connections we have right in front of us that may be and, uh, more important than the ones online. Um, your family should be more important. And Jesus says, but I need to be the primary one. Jesus says that because if I stay connected to him and he's my primary connection, he's going to help me to be a better husband than I can be all by myself. He's going to help me to improve in being a better father than I can accomplish all by myself. He's going to help me in business better than be me being out there all by myself trying to hustle my job and my finances. He, he makes it very clear to the disciples. He makes it clear to you and I. He needs to be our primary connection. So condition number one, it means that I, I have to stay close to him. I've got to pray, read my Bible. I need to go to church. Uh, and I, I need to, to be obedient to his word. Give when he wants me to give of my time, my talent, my treasures to people around me. Jesus says, love other people as I have loved you. So that's condition number one. I want to focus a little more today on condition number two, which in verse seven says, you must remain, uh, my words must remain in you. So in order for me to pray a prayer and have these wishes and God promises that he'll do them for me, it really has to be the words of Jesus inside of me being prayed for. So, so when I say that, the question to you and the question to me is this. Do I pray like Jesus prays? Do I want what Jesus wants? You see, all of my prayers uh, would be answered if all of my prayers were the same prayers that Jesus prayed. If they were the same words that Jesus prayed. Now, now think about that. When Jesus was here on earth, everything he prayed for and asked to the Father, the Father did it. I mean, the Father literally would bless his prayer. Now, there's one prayer that you might say, Pastor, I don't know about the one at the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, which is just a couple hours after he says this, he's going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, he's going to pray, and he's going to say, Now, Heavenly Father, I, I know I'm moving towards the cross, I know that uh, I'm to die there on a cross. And he prays. He shows us the humanity within him, the struggle with doing what you want, Lord, versus what, I, what my, my fleshly desire wants. And he says, if there's any other way you can make this cup pass for me, if there's another way to accomplish all this, I'd love to take the other route. 
But listen to Jesus' words. He says, as my Father's words are in me, I want my words, which are the Father's words and my words, to be in you. And if you pray my words, then they will be answered. Whatever you wish that is in alliance, in accordance with the will of God, I will say yes to. Our Heavenly Father will, will meet our, answer our prayers. And so Jesus went on to say, you know, but he said, but listen, Lord, if the cross is the only way, if the cross is what's necessary, he said, not my will be done, but yours be done. You see, even in that prayer, Jesus was saying, I'm struggling with all the emotions of, I, I clothe myself in humanity, and I know this is going to be a different, difficult road. But he went on to say, I want you to answer my prayer. If it's best to go to the cross, then that's what I want. And in the same way, as we look through this passage, isn't it true that if I'll do whatever God wants, if he'll answer my prayers the way that he has, has all, he desires to answer them, whether I like the answer or don't like the answer, it'll bear much fruit. Question, how much fruit did the cross provide for you and I? It saved all of mankind. It was very difficult for Jesus, but he did it. And in his obedience to his heavenly father, he willingly went to the cross and did that for you and I that our sins might be forgiven, that we might have the huge fruit and blessing of having a heavenly relationship, a divine connection with Jesus while we're here on earth and we get to live eternity in heaven with him. I mean, that's the, that's the greatest fruit in the world, right? So as you and I consider this verse, we're asking ourselves this question, do I want my prayers to be powerful and effective? Do I want our Heavenly Father to say yes to them. And then there's going to be times where our Heavenly Father is going to say no to our requests. But if in your heart you have this desire, Lord, not my will be done, but yours, then even when he says no, he has answered my prayer. He has given me what I wish for. And what I wish for is not always what I ask for, if I can say it that way. It's like, Lord, here's what I want, but if you know it won't be good for me, then don't give it to me, Lord. That's what I wish. And if I pray that prayer as Jesus prayed that prayer, then my Heavenly Father will always give me what I wish for. The question is, do you wish for what the Lord wishes your life to be like? The fruit that the Lord wants to put in your life, in your relationships, he wants to bless your marriage, your family. He wants to bless you with a godly man. He wants to bless you with a godly woman if you're not married yet. He wants to do all of this for you. And the question is, if you're praying that prayer and you want the person that God has created for you to spend the rest of your life, if you pray that prayer, then he'll give that person to you. We just have to hold on. Sometimes we see somebody we really, really like. We say, Lord, that's him or that's her. Um, so let's say yes to this, Lord. I'm really not, I just want your approval. I'm not asking for you to answer this prayer and what's best for me. I just want you to prove what I'm doing. And in those moments, the Lord says, no, 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 you can't do that. But listen, the words of Jesus must abide in me in order for my prayers to be effective. If I'm going to pray like I just described, then I have to have a feel of what are the types of words that Jesus prayed to his Heavenly Father that his Heavenly Father always answered. And the only way that's, that's possible, and we, we looked at that, this verse said there's two conditions when the Lord is going to listen to your prayers and answer them effectively. And condition number two was, my words must remain in you. So the question to you is, how much of God's word is, is inside of you today? If I were to ask you to, to quote, and, and I'm not talking about perfectly every word of a verse, but if I were to ask you to roughly quote what you know of the Bible how much would come out of you? If you were to tell me, you know, Pastor Steve, I only know maybe one or two verses, and, uh, and you wouldn't have known perfectly, but you have, a, you have an idea of what they mean, and it kind of sits in your heart when you're in tough times, those one or two verses come to your mind. Then, then I would tell you, you're going to have probably a lot of prayers not answered that you're comfortable with, because there's not enough of God's word inside of you. 
I, I would tell you, you need to read God's word regularly. It's not words from a, a, a good rabbi who died and left some words of wisdom. It's the living word of God. It's Jesus' word. He says, I am the word. I am truth. And the more and more I feel, fill my life with the words of Jesus, it positions me to pray powerful and effective prayers. And when I pray those prayers and the Lord answers them, he always answers three ways, right? He says, yes, no, or he says, wait. I'm, I'm pretty sure wait is probably the frustrating one. But, but when the Lord answers those prayers, and I've got a lot of God's word hidden in my heart, then when, I, when he gives me an answer, there's a real peace and joy that that's the right answer. That that answer that God gave me for this situation, it means it's going to be okay. He has a great plan, even if it's a difficult moment, a difficult answer from the Lord. You know, if I look back and we look through the Gospels, Jesus sat down with his disciples and they said, hey, how should we pray? And Jesus said this, right? We all have heard the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, now listen to this part. Thy kingdom come, here it is, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, so that prayer, Jesus even taught early in, on in his ministry, then you and I are to pray a prayer in such a way that says, Lord, I'm going to pray for what I want, but I want you to answer it in a way that's best for me. And I'm going to be okay with that. I'm going to trust in that. I'm going to embrace that. Whether it's yes, no, or wait, I'm going to live in joy. I'm going to have peace of mind, and I'm not going to live in anxiety. But all the joy, peace, and no anxiety only comes when I have Jesus' words rolling around inside of my heart as I pray these prayers. If not, all kinds of fear and anxiety and like, Lord, why did you say no? Do you really know what you're doing? Is this really what's best for me? And your brain spins out, your emotions spin out. And Jesus says, just trust, trust in me. If you stay connected to me and you stay connected to my words, then I'll help you through this. You'll maintain a level of joy in good circumstances or even in bad circumstances. Because he says, I'll be with you. So, so listen, here's six very quick, very quick, six practical ways for Jesus' word to, to abide in you. That in, by, by, or staying connected to Jesus' word, hiding Jesus' word in my heart. Here's six ways to do that. And if we do this, then we're going to stay closely connected to Jesus. He's our primary source. I should be reading more of his word than I read Instagram. I should read more of his words than I do Facebook. I should read more of his words than I spend time gaming. I should, and on and on and on, right? That's a primary connection and a powerful connection. So here's step number one. Now, step number one, if you're going to hide God's word in your heart, and then you're going to live off of that word. Those will be the thoughts and the words that you live from, a place that you live from. If you're going to do that, number one, you have to make a plan. You can write that down. If you, you know, plan to do nothing, then you plan to fail, right? I mean, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. If you're going to pray and you're going to put God's word in your life and pray with God's words in a powerful way, uh, the only way to do that is come up with a plan. I guess the question is, do you have a plan? Is there a regular time that you meet with the Lord every day? I mean, you know, if, if I just told my wife, hey, you know, you might not see me for a month. I'm just decided to do some things. I'll get back to you. How many of you know that would not go well? That would not work out. She would feel like she's not a primary concern of mine, that she isn't one of the primary relationships in my life. It would just get bad quick. She expects me to have a plan to spend a regular, ongoing, continuous connection and relationship with her. And that's what we said is what it means to, to be connected to Jesus Christ. If I'm just going to stay connected, it means I have this ongoing continuous, conscious uh, focus that I'm in a relationship with Jesus. 
I'm talking to him in prayer and I'm reading his word. So, so number one, you, you, have to, you have to make a plan. Uh, much praying is not done because we do not plan to pray. Let me put it that way. If, if not much reading of God's word is ever going to happen unless I plan to read God's word. You know, it's so easy in the world we live in today. You could very easily download an app on your phone and every day when you drive to work, you can hit play. It will read God's word to you. You could read through the whole Bible in a year. They have a plan and it only takes about 10, 15, 20 minutes a day. Just about your drive from home to work. But, but you need to come up with a plan if you're going to do this. So, so create a plan, number one, uh, to abide or keep Jesus' word in your heart. And number two, you need to, to learn to memorize things, uh, memorize scripture. So you see, the, the way I view the world and the choices I make with the people I work with, with the family that I love, and with the marriage I'm involved in, with, with every relationship... I see and approach them through a filter. It's my worldview. If I have a biblical worldview where Jesus says, be kind, be slow to speak, and listen long, if that's my filter, then I'm going to treat people and approach people that way. But listen, if I don't have God's word in my heart, and I'm listening to all the, the war of, of connections and attention that, I, that I'm getting from, from media and everywhere else, it's... it's it, you know, they can teach me, I'm number one. They shouldn't do that to me. This isn't fair. I deserve better than this. If that's my filter, that bleeds over in my relationship with my marriage, my kids, my work, everything. And so, so God says there's amazing fruit if you'll hide my word in your heart. And, and the way to do that is to memorize it. Hey, I would tell you, get, get a verse that, that, that you love. And here's, here's what's so important. You'll be reading through God's word, and one of them will just jump out at you. There'll be one verse just going, oh my goodness, that's just crazy good. That really speaks to me where I'm living right now. Boy, take that verse, put it on a sticky, put it on your iPhone, put it, put it on the sticky on the refrigerator or the mirror. I say that's the two places you go all the time. So the bathroom to look in the mirror and to the refrigerator to get some food. And every time you see that, just see it and say it in your mind, say it in your heart. Here's what happens. You know, it may say, um, you know, love, the, love your neighbor as yourself. And, you know, next day you go outside and your, your neighbor's dog got in your trash can. There's a mess all over the ground and you're mad at your neighbor. And in that moment, you'd like to give him a piece of your mind. And the verse will jump up in your heart. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love your neighbor. And in that moment, it calms me down. I put all the trash back in my trash can. And I, I come up with a loving way to keep that from happening again. You, you see, when I hide God's word in my heart, another great one is God has not given me a spirit of fear, of anxiety, of living in a world of, of fearfulness, but of power and love and a sound mind. That's a great verse. You should hide that verse in your heart. If I, another one, see, if I just keep going, you can see what's happening here. Psalms 139, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God knit me in my mother's womb. He has great plans for my life. He, he sees me. He knows me. He cares about me. He has a great purpose for my life. You see, in, the, in that moment, I approach life through the filter of God's word, which provides amazing fruit in the life that I live here on earth. So we said, number one, make a plan to read God's word. Number two, memorize God's word. When you memorize God's word, it will help you in moments of crisis. You know, there are times where you're in a crisis when you get really bad news at a doctor's office or a tragedy happens. It's in that moment that whatever words of God's are inside of you, man, they will come up and they will be a source of of life and help and peace in the middle of chaos if it's hidden in your heart. So number three, number three, how do we hide God's word in our life is to meditate. Now when I say meditate, it's not like um, something weird and singing songs and humming chants. Meditate just simply means to have focused attention on. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll say, God has not given me a spirit of fear. So this is in the book of Timothy. But of power, so he's given me power, 
uh, power to overcome anything th that I need. So God gives that to me. God gives me a power, love. He'll always help me feel unconditionally loved, even when I've made choices bad last week or maybe 20 minutes ago. He, he reminds me that, that I'm unconditionally loved. He'll never stop loving me. And he gives me a sound mind. And I'll just sit on that verse and meditate. I'll have a talk with the Lord about it. So Lord, like, what does that verse mean to me? And then as I'm sitting there, just kind of having a talk with the Lord, thinking out loud, if you will. And I'm looking at this verse. The Lord reminds me of an area that I've had a lot of anxiety over. And he says, I've not given you fear, and you have a lot of fear in this area of your life. And I've given you a sound mind. I want you to have a sound mind about it. I don't want you to be anxious about it. I love you. I'm giving you the power to endure this situation. I need you to chill and relax. And it's only in meditating or taking God's word, holding that one verse in front of me and the Lord and say, Lord, so let's talk about this. And just get in a quiet place and think about, Lord, what does this verse mean to me? And just as you're in that quiet place, it positions you to hear from the Lord. So we make a plan to read God's Word, memorize God's Word. We make a plan to spend time meditating or thinking about it, studying it, studying God's Word. Number four, journal. Write that down. You can journal. When you, uh, uh, through the Word, or through your words and lips, uh, disentangles, excuse me, through your, your, your lips and your fingertips, words and thoughts get disentangled. Words and thoughts get untangled. You know, think about that this morning. Uh, some, t some of you out there, can, you can talk. You can just talk. Some of you can't talk well. Some of you can share your feelings well. Some of you can't do that very well. And I would just tell you that when I sit down and read God's Word, there's something about writing. A journal simply means to write down your thoughts. It doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be accurate. It only is an expression of how I'm feeling. And there's something about sitting down and writing down my words and my thoughts or talking with somebody about them. Maybe you're not a person who likes to journal. But another way to do this, sit down with a friend and just share your thoughts. Just tell them, I'm not looking for any answers. I just want to throw out all my feelings with you. And then I want you to pray with me about them. But there's something about writing down how I feel. And then when I go to meditate or I uh, you know, pray and have time with the Lord, I'm going to look at my journal and I'm say, Lord, that's how I feel. And then he'll give me a thought to write down. And he may give me a verse. I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. Don't be anxious for anything. Don't I take care of the birds of the field? Don't I? Can't I take care of you? I'm all powerful. I'm omnipresent. I'm everywhere at all time. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I'm all omniscient. I'm all knowing. I'm going to take care of you. And when I write it down in the journal, there's something about seeing my feelings written down and then seeing the answer the Lord gave me that helps me to move forward. So we plan to have time in God's Word, we memorize God's Word, we meditate on God's Word, we take the thoughts of God's Word and we write them down in a journal. Number five, every great uh, Christian or mature Christian, I should say, should listen if you want to mature. You don't have to be mature, but if you want to mature, uh, Christians know how to listen or read to great writers. There are some great Christian authors out there who have written some amazing books that help you and I unpack God's Word so we can know it on a deeper level. And I would just challenge you, you, you and I both need to read some books by some great uh, preachers or pastors or Christian authors. And when we read those books, they help us understand God's Word better. And it settles down in our heart and positions us to pray great prayers that God will answer. And it will help us in the time of trouble and in the time of need. Number six, the last one, is just in your reading of God's word, I want you to keep the living person of Jesus before you as you read the Bible. 
and consciously remind yourself repeatedly that these are his words. He's not a dead teacher, but a living Christ. He's not a dead teacher, but a living Christ. So that simply means when I'm reading God's word, if it's going to be powerful in me, I have to say, Jesus wrote this for me. God the Father wrote this. They're, they're one and the same. And the Holy Spirit comes and he helps me understand. He's my counselor. He's a comforter. That's what Jesus said. You guys won't be very good by yourself. You're going to need my help. So I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And he's going to help you with my word. And so when I sit there, I say, Holy Spirit, you're my counselor, my comforter. Jesus said that you would be in me and you would help me as I read uh, read the word of God. And so I, in that moment, I, I recognize that, that God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're alive and well. They live in me. And the Holy Spirit wants to communicate to me. And I say, Holy Spirit, as I read God's word, what are you saying to me? You see, when I, when I talk to the Holy Spirit like that, I'm engaging a living God who is alive and well, who wants to help me, rather than just reading a book as if it's some kind of historical event only and that there's no life to it. It is the living Word of God. It's what the Holy Spirit and Jesus are trying to say to me and get me to understand, so I ask them for help. And if you'll do those six things, um, you'll have a powerful, effective prayer life, and our Heavenly Father will answer all your wishes and your dreams as they align themselves with the will of God. He will say yes to those answers. Hey, listen, I want to close with this verse. John 15, uh, actually not John 15, uh, 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Listen to this. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. So we're approaching Him in prayer. That if we ask anything according to His will, there it is, that's, that's according to His words, that's the will of God, He hears us. Now look at verse 15. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask for in Him. Hey, I just want you to know the Lord hears your prayers. And sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. When he says no, hopefully here's your heart's position. Lord, if you say no, I want your will and not mine. And if you say no, then that's, that's what I want. Uh, I, I desire a yes, but I want your will in this, the answer to this prayer. And I'll accept it. And I'll live at peace with it. And when we do that, we experience a life full of joy and peace. And we feel loved. And we're having this ongoing relationship with Jesus that's absolutely amazing. Hey, as I, I, I preach this sermon this morning, I would just share with you. I'd like to encourage you, and maybe you're not attending in person yet. I would encourage you to take communion this week. There's nothing like sitting down reading God's Word, having a time of talk and meditation with the Lord. Lord, I love you. My life's like this. What's, you know, I need you to help me with it. Um, I'm reading your Word. I've got this verse that's special to me. How does that apply to where I'm at right now? And then say, Holy Spirit, help me. Help me process this moment in time that I'm living with God's Word. And then take communion. Take Take some grape juice, take some bread. The Bible says that you are to remember what Jesus did for you. And what Jesus did so amazingly when he died on the cross and rose again is he provided a connection for us. There's, there's nothing like coming to communion and saying, wow, Jesus died on the cross. This is his blood and his body that was shed for me. And because he did this, I can stay on this, in this continuous, ongoing conscious relationship with Jesus Christ every day, every hour, day in and day out. And just take communion and say, Jesus, I'm so grateful that you made it easy for me to stay connected to you. And take communion. I know God will bless you for it. Hey, I love you guys. Come and see us sometime. Uh, we love you. If you need anything, just let us know online. 
We would love to pray for you. I help you in any way we can. Hey, God bless you. I'm Pastor Steve. Thanks so much for joining us today. Make sure to connect with us online and feel free to share this live stream on your Facebook page and we'll see you next week.